So, Michael, uh, Marvel's back. Uh, well, I mean, they never really left, did they? No. So, yeah, I'm not sure them being back is the most accurate thing to say, but they're kind of back, I guess. Um, yeah, because they announced a ton of new stuff. Um, there's Again, when I saw this at first, I didn't think it was real, but apparently this th- these are the movies. Uh, Avengers Kang Dynasty. Okay. Uh, uh, that uh, That's coming out in 2025. Don't blame me. I voted for Kodos. Great. And then... Also in 2025, another Avengers movie called Avengers Secret Wars. And that, guess what phase that will be? Uh, six? Yeah, phase okay. six. Because like they're, they're on four. So, okay, yeah, that is weird. They're jump- so what's happening with five? Is phase five just... I, I don't know. Because here's the thing. I thought the phases like ended with like a, uh, y- you know, an Avengers movie. Yeah, yeah. Like usually each one, because obviously phase one was Avengers Assemble. Phase yeah. two was, yeah, like... Age of Ultron, yeah, yeah, and, and then, then yeah, obviously they had three. Infinity War, yeah, Endgame, and Endgame, yeah, yeah, uh, and now yeah, so fate, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever is going to be the end of Phase Four. Really, they're done yeah. with Phase Four already. What, That's what, so weird. What, what has happened in Phase Four? Like, um, what is going on? Yeah, like they haven't introduced anything. Like, oh yeah, they, the, the multiverse so is getting some stuff. Yeah, but, you know that's not not really. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like Marvel just after Endgame, they didn't have a plan. And they're just like, oh yeah, release all these movies. Sure, like, let's make like a billion dollars every like few months. And then, oh yeah, now finally it seems like they've got a plan again with this Avengers uh, Kang Dynasty. I don't even know who Kang is, but I, I'm sure I'll find yeah. out. I, I finally got them up. Apparently they've got another one in Phase 5, which is Captain America New World Order. That was it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, that's... yeah so Phase 5 seems really boring too. Like Phase 5, they've got Blade. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Well, look, well, we'll see. I mean... <laughs> If it's based on recent Marvel movies, I don't think Phase 5 is going to be great. But again, you know, whatever. They're, they're kind of dead, but they keep coming back. Just like your typical uh, character in, in a Marvel movie who you think they're dead and then they get resurrected. Uh, Gamora, anyone? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of Loki, but yeah, Gamora's an even better yeah, one. Yeah, well, like I mean, there's, there's so many fucking examples on. Yes. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Select and Reflect, the movie review podcast where we look at films that have come out in the near and distant past. We give them a couple of watches and evaluate them beyond first impressions. I'm your host Michael and I'm joined as always by my co-host Luke and this week we are celebrating the 25 year anniversary of the film Austin Powers International Man of Mystery. So Luke, why don't you tell us a thing or two about Austin Powers International Man of Mystery? Sure thing Michael. Uh, By the way, um. Did you tell the audience what the other reason is we're doing Austin Powers this year? Apart well, from it being the 25-year anniversary. Well, I asked you if there was another reason, and you seemed to say no. I did say no, yeah. But obviously I was tricking you. Oh, I've been tricked. Who could forget this ed, uh, this year? The greatest commercial ever, the Austin Powers Super Bowl commercial. Um, uh, Austin Powers cast reunite in Super Bowl ad. Did you see this? No, I didn't actually. Yeah, this is in February this year for uh, General Motors. Effort to help save the planet. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, our takeover of General Motors is complete. Dr. Abel, GM's Ultium platform will power our whole operation. Now we can reduce tailpipe emissions. Oh, for my son. Your son? I shall name him Baby Me. No, his name is Kyle. You must help save the world first. Then you can take over that world. Hold on, I've got it. I will help save the world first, then take over the world. She literally just said that. This Scott, is good. You just don't get it, do you? What? You didn't get it. Oh, we're right back to you. You're never gonna get you it. can't draw me in a <laughs> You act like a child. You can't push my buttons anymore. Oh, we reduce our carbon footprint. Okay, let's go. We're going all electric. Everybody in! Not you, Scott. Bye-bye, that was really good like it made me so want to like uh get just just motors in general you know like not any specific motors just like you know at this point i mean i really hope that specific motors comes out with a, a kind of hit back hits back because like general, general motors, motors is killing it. It. Yeah, yeah 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 no they they, they really are Again, yeah, Dr. Evil's going to help 
General Motors reduce their carbon footprint and go all electric by 2025. I like how that's subtly putting the idea in people's heads that like, uh, you know, like green renewable energy is actually bad. I, th- I think that is their, their long, long-term long play there, General Motors. But yeah, anyway, so uh, Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. It's a 1997 American spy comedy film directed by Jay Roach. It is the first installment of the Austin Powers series and stars franchise co-producer and writer Mike Myers. And of course, Mike Myers plays a couple of characters, doesn't he, Michael? He plays at least two. At least two. So this was also, I saw, produced by Demi Moore, which I found interesting. Oh, G.I. Jane 2. Can't wait. (laughs) Great. So the movie stars Mike Myers, uh, Elizabeth Hurley, um, Michael York, and Mimi Rogers, amongst others. Uh, the uh, release date of this movie, Michael, was May the 2nd, 1997, so we're a bit over its 25-year anniversary, but, you know, hey, it's uh, it's it's fine. <laughs> no issues there. And yeah, uh, Michael, uh, this the runtime for this is only 91 minutes. Oh, and um, you, so I know that you like saying that it's barely a movie. That's what you said about, um, what was it, the Minions? Yeah, Minions, though, was like, you could tell they were doing a lot of stupid shit just to get to the 90-minute mark. Yeah, whereas this one felt kind of, like, coherent. Yeah, well, yeah, this one felt coherent and it felt like they put, like, effort in trying to make it funny. Like, yeah. you know, and of course, there are some bits which aren't really necessary, but I think overall, like, it's 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 a very different to the Minions in that. Um, Michael, can you guess what the budget was for um, Austin Powers? Oh, um, well, okay. Why so, did you act like, so surprised? Yeah, I always forget. I, I literally, I don't, you know, maybe at some point in my life I should actually think about it before you ask me. Um, I think this film would have cost quite a bit of money because, like, obviously you had the, like, the stuff going on, like, all of the things going on. Uh, and also, I guess Mike Myers probably would cost quite a bit of money. So, I guess this film costs 45 million. Jesus Christ, you're such a fucking idiot. Like, you're such an idiot. Like, no, the, the budget is 16.5 million. Um, That's too which, much. of course, is nearly a third of what you guessed. Uh, Michael, like, you see, Mike Myers would cost a lot. You do realize, like, he's playing, like, half the characters here. Uh, mm. That's not number one. Number two, is there any other, like, big name in this movie? Uh, did you say Elizabeth Hawley? Is that her name? I wouldn't say Elizabeth Hurley is a big name. Uh, well, if she's not a big name, how come I got her name almost correct when I just said it? Exactly. Do you, do you like? Do you think these sets look like really high quality? Well, like not necessarily, but you know there are certainly a, a decent number of them. Great. I, I just you, you really don't think about these, do you? Mm, well, let's see if let's see if I thought about how much money it made. A hundred million. Okay, you haven't gone more than double. Because one hundred answer... million. Yeah, that'd be funny if you said that. Yeah, I wish but I the, would uh... have that idea. <laughs> The, I, the, I should have said, I should, oh, damn it, I totally missed the opportunity to say one million dollars. And then I'd go, no, Michael, it's not 1967 anymore. Yeah, that would have been and funny. Then, and then you'd go 100 million dollars. If only I was a funny person. If only, but uh, the actual box office was 67.7 million dollars. So a modest success, but what's really interesting is, uh, I mean, we won't, we, I won't tell you the amount in case we review, <laughs> review it one day, even though I'm pretty sure you will forget. I would definitely forget, but don't tell me. Yes, yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's crazy how much the sequel, how much more the sequel grossed than the original. That yeah. would almost explain why it is that maybe some people have only seen the sequel to this film or had only seen the sequel to this film and not the like original yourself. film itself. Like myself. Yeah. Wow. And uh, you've also seen Goldmember, of course. I have seen Goldmember, yeah. He paints the, the penises gold. Yes, and... Um, what was that great line? I think it's... Michael How about... Kane. No, you... Oh, oh, sorry. I was thinking about something else. I was thinking about it. He says, you crazy Dutch bastard. Oh, right. <laughs> the one where he goes like, oh, yeah, I hate... There's two things I hate. Oh, yes, yeah. It's like uh, the French and, and bigots or something like that. No, it's like people who judge people... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, by... What, where they come nation- from? Yeah. yeah, the nationality, their background, and the Dutch. Like that. Oh, yeah. Okay, that makes more... Of course, it would be... Yeah, I literally said the word Dutch earlier. <laughs> I was just thinking because they were British, it would be that they hate the French. No, of course. Uh, but anyway, yes, yeah, so that's Gold Member, and of course, one day we will probably do the spy who shagged me. Uh, mm. But yeah, today is not that day. We're starting seeing with the first one, the international. You said, the fact you said do and do can also mean like have sex with is, I think, very funny. Okay, uh, we are going to start with the international uh, man of mystery, Austin Powers, the international man of mystery. So, Michael, did you like this movie? Yes, I did. Um, I thought it was entertaining. I think, did you have a groovy time, baby? Mm, yes, I suppose I did have a groovy time. I, I will say, I, I think suppose with, I did yeah. with, with the uh, the the comedy. I think it it could have been 
maybe a, a little bit less um I, I, I dare i say juvenile uh for, for my wow. sophisticated tastes i like see i i as long as comedy is funny that's fine and i like absurdist humor i don't mind some of the juvenile stuff um yeah i i, I yeah. like see i am m- saying that but like when we actually get to the comedy i'm gonna reveal one of my favorite jokes and it was actually like a really childish joke yeah exactly so. yeah no i mean it, it, it can work as long as it's like you know just it can be clever and childish you know th- th- those two things don't have to be you know opposite of each other um but yeah i i will say that um this movie it could have been it could have used another like rewrite on the script i feel like it wasn't that tight there you know there was a lot of areas where i'm like oh that's not great filmmaking right there or that's not you know it's it's also an issue with the script yeah. uh yeah a lot of issues with it but you know overall you're not really here for that you're here to laugh at like maya's going oh behave like that and of course we will throughout the review there's a 50 percent of this review is just going to be copying austin powers phrases and saying them back and laughing at that uh, because, yes. Yeah, I think that's why this movie was, of course, very successful. You know, there's a lot of quotable lines. Yes. On the- As uh, Austin Powers would say, a great success. <laughs> um. So yeah, no, yeah, I I agree that it does have um, it, it is very quotable. Um, of course, there's uh the sharks with freaking laser beams. That's I thought like that's one of the most quotable things. And I, you got uh, it wrong. Um, I thought is it not sharks with freaking laser beams? Freaking, freaking laser beams. Okay, so I say freaking instead of freaking. Fine. Yeah. Fine, I'm sorry for saying freaking <sighs> okay. instead of freaking. How many lit picks or nitpicks do you have? I've got one nitpick. Uh, obviously, this film is a very difficult film to nitpick. What of it being a um, a, a satirical uh, okay, parody? Okay, I've got two, you go. Yeah. So mine is, I find it weird that during the credits, they do a freeze frame on Austin Powers' face at several points, and yet they include, they, they then put the names in the title sequence of like completely random people and it's just a bit weird because you would think obviously like if you were doing that it would be like you'd freeze frame on the person and then you put the name of like the person who plays them okay so uh, my nitpick is so right okay i think this movie may have contributed to you know the whole fucking what was it cool britannia thing michael oh yeah know? that was going around like in the late 90s you know because everyone loved the spice girls and tony blair and david beckham i don't know probably some other stuff going on around there uh around that time but uh o- oasis as well who could forget um, maybe but- yeah, um, all that shit was was good and all, but you know, the and this movie again probably contributed to that. But this movie also damaged the uh, the perception of British people. I feel because I have always wondered where this stereotype comes from uh, that Americans think that Americans think that British people don't have good teeth, mm. and I've always been like quite confused about it because obviously like we don't, and we you know we have the fucking NHS, you know, like we don't have. Um, we don't have bad teeth. But anyone under the age of 18, you can basically get free dentistry, I think. I think yes. that's the case. Yes. Um, so, so, like, why did it, Why is this joke that we have bad teeth? And then uh, re-watching this now, I'm like, oh, it's because of Austin Powers. That makes sense. The Americans yeah. are so uncreative. And, well, they're, they're like, oh, yeah, the British people have bad teeth. What is that based on? Oh, yeah, Austin Powers has bad teeth, and they make fun of it throughout the movie. Even though the joke is like, oh, he, he that was acceptable in the 60s. In the 90s, that's not the case anymore. Yeah, it is a bit, yeah, because it's a bit yeah. weird, because literally the film itself contradicts it by being like, by the fact that the, you know, the woman who calls him out on having bad teeth is a British person yeah. in the modern day. With the and in real life as well. Elizabeth Hurley is British. Yes, yes exactly. That's true. Yeah. So yeah, I was just like, oh, that, so that's where that joke comes from. Uh, so yeah, uh, there we go. And you're uh, saying you got triggered? Triggered. I was just, I was just very disappointed with it. I mean, it's, it's not the movie's fault. Actually, you know, it's not really a nitpick on the movie because you know it's a nitpick on America. Yeah, just how like uncreative they are. Uh, my nitpick, Michael, as you know, uh, my last name is Austin, of course. I um, do know that. Yeah, and of course, <laughs> this movie is called Austin Powers. That is interesting. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah. If only your last name is Powers, that would be really good. Yeah, but you know, nobody has the name Powers because it's such a cool name. You know, yeah. that, that that'd be too unreal. As I as Homer like. says, he got it from a hairdryer. Yes, exactly. Uh, even though there was a footballer who played for Tranmere Rovers called Max Power, I think. Uh, oh, wow. That, that's actually true, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, Michael, uh, let's get into the plots of this movie. So, uh, as a swinging fashion photographer by day and a groovy British super agent by night, Austin Powers is the 60s most shagadilic spy baby. But can he stop megalomaniac Dr. Evil? I'm sorry, where's the, where did you get this uh, <laughs> this description from? I just copied it from the website I use. Okay, so it's not, because I was going to say, like this feels like it's not, because usually don't you read like the Wikipedia plot summary? Yes, I... I... So I was thinking, like, this does not sound like Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. 
But can he stop megalomaniac Dr. Evil after the bold villain freezes himself and unthaws in the 90s with the help of sexy sidekick <laughs> Vanessa Kensington? He just might. This is my... We haven't mentioned this person's name yet. Do you know which person I'm going to mention? Fictional person I'm going to mention now, Michael? James Bond. Yeah, James Bond. There we, go. we haven't mentioned James Bond yet, but of course this is a parody or a satire of James Bond films, isn't it? That's a... Yes. You know, that's, we're really breaking new ground saying that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's the thing. It says on Wikipedia, you know, it's a parody of James Bond films and other popular culture from the 1960s. And yeah, um, there's just a bunch of James Bond tropes that they go through. Yes. Know? Yeah, that, that is that is definitely the case. Uh, that exists in the 90s as well, but also kind of ridiculing the era of the 60s or the Bond movies of the 60s or, or just the campiness yeah, in Yes, general. campiness, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I was wondering if we were going to talk about the fact that, of course, um, this film, I think, is kind of... Credited as being the reason why we had, um, you know, like Daniel Craig and like the idea of trying to make James Bond not somebody who could be so easily ridiculed and parodied. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, do you know what? I'll, I've got a, uh, I've got a quote from that because this actually just goes to what you're saying. So uh, Daniel Craig, uh, who portrayed James Bond on screen uh, from 2006 to 2021, credited Austin Powers franchise with a relatively serious tone of later Bond films. Uh, In a 2014 interview, uh, Craig said, We had to destroy the myth because Mike Myers fucked us, making it impossible to do the gags of earlier Bond films, which Austin Powers has satirised. Yeah, but the thing is, Daniel Craig's like, oh, he fucked us, but... You know, know, maybe he fucked them in a good way, as Austin Powers so often did. But that's the thing, would Daniel Craig be James Bond if it wasn't for Austin Powers, or would they have gone for a campier alternative? Because of course, you know why Daniel Craig got the James Bond part. Michael, you know which movie he starred in back in 2004? Layer Cake? Yeah, Layer Cake. And that was a very serious, like, gangster movie. He played a very serious gangster, I think. You know, he was like, yes. on, yeah, a proper and did everything on time. And he took, you know, took his business seriously. And of course, that led him to becoming uh, James Bond after that. So, and yeah, that's the thing you watch. Like, of course, the Piers Brosnan Bond movies came out at the same time. And they were still kind of stuck in the old, like, James Bond, like, kind of, in the old ways, basically. And this basically just kind of eroded that and just, you know, I remember when Dying of a Day came out in 2002. Remember that movie? Yes, Michael? yeah. It, it just feels like so past its time, especially as Austin Powers had been mocking it for like three three movies. Yeah, it's really weird to bring this up because they're a, um, a not very well regarded YouTube channel, but Watch Mojo, I remember, okay. uh, like was what kind of reminded me of the whole like intersection between James Bond and Austin Powers because they had like top 10, um, I guess it was like top 10 movie reboots, I think might have been it. And one of them was, uh, you know, Casino Royale. And they were that like, makes sense. Yeah, and they, they were like, um, after... Uh, after Die Another Day was so ridiculous, they needed Casino Royale and Daniel Craig to reboot the James Bond franchise for a post Austin Powers era, something like that. And I always remember yeah. that. I was like, yeah, good point, Watch Mojo. Good media analysis I can always expect from you. Yeah, also, what uh, made James Bond the way it did was because of um, Jason Bourne, the Jason Bourne movies. Yes. Which, again, were like kind of like James Bond esque, had literally the same fucking initials. Um, and of yes. course, they were about an American agent who's gone rogue, which is uh, slightly different, but yeah. Very serious action. Those are great movies, those Bond movies. And again, I think people who you know run James Bond saw that and were like, oh, right, so that's being that's that's doing very well. That's being successful, the Jason Bond movies. And then we've got Austin Powers mocking us for our campy stuff. We need to get serious. We need to go with Casino Royale. And yeah, that was a, obviously a great choice, it turned out. You know, every, everyone was doing gritty reboots in the 2000s, of course. We talked about that with Batman Begins, didn't we? Yeah. And uh, yeah, what, what really you know, helped James Bond, you know, pushed it in that direction was, yeah. was these movies. Yeah. And Superman Returns with uh, Kevin Spacey's very gritty plan of um, of crashing, like, an asteroid into LA or something. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, but that's the thing. Nowadays, hey, when Bond gets rebooted again with a new Bond, because it's been 20 years since Austin Powers, the last movie, 25 years since this one, maybe they will do, you know, a, uh, a slightly campier movie. But I don't know. Everything just seems to be dark and gritty nowadays. I just think it's kind of impossible to go back to that. But uh, anyway, uh, let's. So uh, that's how it's influenced things. This Austin Powers movie. Uh, but let's get onto the actual uh, plot. So we start off with Doctor Evil in his lair, and we'll get onto him later. But uh, firstly, we are then introduced to Austin Powers, and the first thing that I notice, Michael, you know, when he's running through the streets of London, you know, evading all those girls, is the music. Mm. The music is just 
fantastic, do, do, isn't do, it? Do, 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 Yeah, it's like a really iconic tune. Do, do, yeah. do, 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 do. I, I think iconic, Michael, is the right word for it. And yeah, it's. I think it's one of the reasons why the movie is so, I think, fondly remembered. Um, if we can get it up here. Oh, what, what the fuck is this? Here we go. Imagine, you know, Austin being a bit of a cheeky chappy, you know, mm. running through running through London to this music. Yeah. It's just, it's great. It's really fucking good. And that's the thing, you, you think back to this movie and it's like, oh yeah, it's mocking James Bond, but that actually, that music is... Just so fucking good. But let's talk about Austin Powers, Michael. I guess the biggest reason why this became a uh, this, this franchise became a success um, as the a character, titular character. Exactly, Michael, the titular character. So we're introduced to him immediately, and you can tell, you know, right from the first minute, oh, this is going to be like a memorable, iconic character. And maybe it's just you know us looking back to the past and be like, oh yeah, you you could tell. But I don't know. Immediately as you see him on screen, like his design is great. You know, again, perfect for someone who is meant to be this cheeky chappy kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And his his voice his voice is something that you just want to imitate because it's so funny. Uh, groovy baby. It's groovy baby. And also the quotes, Michael. He is so quotable, you know, like the oh behave. Um oh what well, what's your favourite quote from from him? Um, I think like when the woman's uh nipples come out and he says Is it cold in here? Well, it's not really a quote, is it? Is it? Yeah, I suppose. It's more of like a situation. Yeah, like something, I guess, like more of a standing on its own kind of thing. Yeah, over um, and over again, you know, like Yeah, it's okay. So, wait, yeah. okay. So, let me see Catch if I can... Catchphrase, really. Uh, what I'm trying to remember, see, the thing is, I'm literally a bit embarrassed to admit I'm not quite sure if this is what happens in this one, but the bit where he goes, do I make you horny, baby? Randy. Yes, that. Okay, that is in this. Yeah, I wasn't yes. sure if it was in one Do I make you horny, baby? It's, it's and so he's like just kind of prouncing around on the bed. Yeah. Oh, very shagadilic, baby. You know, you could have hours of fun just quoting Austin Powers. Uh, and just you know, not, you can not have me. powers of fun. Oh, shut up! See, that's the shit comedy that I hate. So much, so much worse than going oh behave like that. <laughs> that's so much funnier. And it is like, you, and just talking like Austin Powers in general is it's it's funny. So immediately you've got a, an iconic character right there with Austin Powers. And you know, seriously, Mike Myers is a genius to come up with this character. You mm. know, because the thing is, what Austin Powers the character it's it's doing two things. It's making fun of the kind of men that used to be attractive back in the day. Mm. You know, the, the kind that looked like the Beatles. Like, the, the joke is, oh, that was sexy. You know, the Beatles. When, of yeah. course, it's really not, <laughs> in, in modern day at least, uh, or even 25 years ago. And yeah, um, it's also, you know, it's not just making fun of, you know, people who had shaggy long hair and just no muscle mass. But it's also the fact that he's being like the foppish version of James Bond as well. Like yes. that's like imagine James Bond in you know in all these scenarios, but he's like this foppish, effeminate, like small guy. You know? Yeah. So you're laughing at him going, imagine you know if cool stern James Bond was like this, but also like lol women actually still like him. Actually, yeah, did find men who looked like Austin Powers attractive back in the 1960s. Uh, apparently so it really works in two ways his uh his character it's uh, yeah it's great and i mean i also feel like it kind of works because like i i get the impression from um like like i, I assume that at least some of the james bonds weren't that sexy like i can accept that uh what's his face sean connery back in sean the day was connery. kind of sexy sexy but like i feel like uh lots of the other ones i reckon weren't really like that sexy by the um yeah, yeah know, I mean, like who was the guy who like Roger roger moore who said Idris Elba can't play James Bond because he's not English English? Yeah, I don't think he was that. Uh, he wasn't bad looking actually. I don't know, but like they all look like old geezers, let's say, and so does well, Austin. I mean, Pels. a lot of them, a lot of them were old, but yeah, Connery and then I think Daniel Craig, Piers Brosnan, unfortunately, least I think, sexy James Bond actor. Yeah, I think, saying? I think Piers Brosnan. You you could say that, but he's just he wasn't in that many good Bond movies. Uh, so it doesn't really work when you, when you think about that. But yeah, in general, you know, you've got a James Bond archetype. In your head, and of course, yeah. Austin Powers is the complete opposite of that. Uh, but yeah, uh, Myers said that the movie and the characters were inspired by the British films, music, and comedy of the 60s and 70s his father had introduced to him as a child. Uh, he said, After my dad died in 1991, I was taking stock of his influence on me as a person and his influence on, on me with comedy in general. So Austin Powers was a tribute to my father. Uh, his father, by the way, is English, I believe. Um, Groovy. 
yeah, Groovy Baby, who introduced me to James Bond, Peter Sellers, uh, The Beatles, uh, The Goodies, Peter Cook, and Dudley Moore. Good, good stuff. But obviously, he repackaged that to create, you know, this Austin Powers character. And yeah, um, I will say, you know, again, great character, great, great idea to uh, to do that. I think he, I remember seeing an interview with Mike Myers where he said, like, he didn't think anybody was going to watch it because, you know, it was it was very much for him and his uh, his brothers, this character. It literally became an international sensation, which kind of stopped the fucking movie. It was going to parody James Bond from making more movies like they had been doing. Uh, it stopped the fucking James Bond franchise in, in its, its track. tracks. Oh, wow. That's funny. We said the same thing at the same time. But uh, oh, yeah, that is really funny. Yeah, no, I know it's cra- it's crazy how it blew up. That's I think it, it's the same thing with Wayne's World, isn't it? You know. Yeah, which I mean, like obviously, yeah, Wayne's World. I mean, w- Wayne's World wasn't really a parody of anything, was it? Oh no, no, yeah, I'm just yeah, saying okay, it, yeah. of how it blew up. Out yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, I mean, obviously, maybe the lesson here is that sometimes making something that comes from like a place of genuine passion and like interest in the project is better than just trying to chase what's popular and trendy. I don't know. Oh. Does that does that sound crazy? Wow, well, that is crazy. Uh, yeah, maybe you should tell Netflix that, Michael. Yes. Uh, that's the th- uh, yeah, again, movies like this could not be made today, but of course that's, you know, it doesn't fit in with the algorithm, but uh, obviously everyone knows that, you know, not yeah. breaking new ground saying that. Yeah, but anyway, uh, so we get some smart, funny comedy, Michael, uh, in the nightclub, which I think has a great name, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, it's like it, there's something, something psychedelic. Yeah, electric psychedelic. I think there's a cat on there, maybe something to do with pussies. Pussy. So then you have uh, the woman who, in the next shot, is a, is a man. And uh, m- making fun of the trickery the Bond or action films uh, you know, try to have with the characters who change from one shot to shot. You know, and the, uh, the bad continuity uh, as well. Uh, yes. You, uh, yeah, yeah. What is it, Michael? It is absurdist comedy. Mm. Uh, and that, that, I, I really do love that. You know, when things are stupid, but the movie knows it, that's, that, that, that is my bag, baby. That is my bag. Um, and of course, we get one of the most iconic jokes a little bit after when Austin wakes up. Um, oh yeah, there's a joke where he pisses for a while, which I don't know. Yeah, I thought. See, I will say there were a few jokes that I think maybe went on a bit too long. That was one of them. But yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. Is, the penis pump joke that was a bit tiresome, I thought. But then, you know, it went, it went on a bit too long. But then they saved it with the book at the end. That, that, yeah, that like really... uh, yeah, I think sometimes that works. Like yeah, when it reaches a point of like m- even more absurdity, like then Just... it gets like funnier. <laughs> Yeah, just unbelievable absurdity. Like, oh, here's your penis pump. There's a receipt. Uh, it's like, yeah, whatever. It's not not that good. But the book, like, <laughs> I swear it's not mine, baby. It's not my bag, baby. And, the, and one book that says, I am Austin Powers. I have a penis pump and it totally is my bag, baby. And it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's it's, uh, yeah, again, that's just, that's that's great. That's, uh, you, you extend the joke so much that it becomes, yeah, just unbelievable and absurd. And yeah, I like that. Uh, but anyway, so... Um, I, I do want to know if you think this, this was a good idea, Michael, how to get Dr. Evil and Austin Powers in the modern day. So obviously they freeze themselves and obviously Dr. Evil escapes in a space rocket and Powers volunteers to be placed in cryostasis in case Dr. Evil returns. And of course it makes sense as to why Austin went back in time, you know, um, to stop Dr. Evil. But Dr. Evil freezes himself as he doesn't want love ruling the world and has to wait for corruption and greed to rule the world that's mm-hmm. what he wants it was that was his motivation right yes which of yeah. course makes total sense yeah i didn't know if that really works i mean was it a boomer idea that things in the 90s were so much more corrupt than back in the day yeah, yeah i mean well i mean in a way it kind of makes sense because like obviously what happened at the end of the 90s you had all of the films about how awful and horrible the world was and how horrible like american life was um so i feel like maybe in the 90s people were getting a bit cynical uh, there is, of course, also the Family Guy joke about how he hires some 80s black guys to uh, lighten the mood, but then he accidentally hires 90s black guys, and they're really violent and try and kill everyone. Okay, it's not really related to this, but, but you know, okay. like, it shows how, like, the 90s was, like, a darker time. Like, in the 80s, it was, like, everyone was, like, bricks on the bus, bricks on the car, bricks to make you a superstar. And then in the, you know... Well, uh, or, or was it just boomers were kids back in the 60s, so they thought yes, it was a more yeah. innocent time. Now yeah, in the 90s, 90s, they're grown up and they're like, oh, actually, you know yeah. what? This- I, I mean, yeah, because it is very... Because, of course, it's funny from our perspective, because nowadays people are always talking about how great the 90s were. They're like, oh, man, the 90s was a simpler time. Remember how lovely and wonderful it was? Like, everyone was yeah. playing their Game Boys. You could... But that's the thing, like, for us, you know, we have nostalgia for when we were kids, obviously, but I, I think we can all agree... Like, the world did get worse around 2008. Like when Obama of, became in charge, yes. Yeah, when Obama became president, yeah. Obviously, 
with the financial crisis and the realization that capitalism had nothing left to offer uh, our generation. Um, and basically from then on, I, I think things have been pretty pretty damn bad. Uh, but yeah, um, also, you know, obviously you can have nostalgia for the 60s or whatever, but Austin Powers says, you know, these capitalists, what does he say when it's like, oh, the Cold War is over? <laughs> That's really yeah. funny when he says, yeah. it's like, those capitalist scum finally got defeated, eh, comrades? And those capitalist pigs finally got what's coming to them, comrades. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I do find it funny how like he just assumes <laughs> that the communists would have won. <laughs> yeah. I find that, yeah, that's funny. Again, just a stupid line which doesn't really jive with his character. But that's the thing, we, I mean, we, we, it doesn't feel like a, a good time to go into a discussion about how, you know, the sexual liberation of the 1960s and, you know, all the drugs and stuff actually wasn't tethered to any, like, you know, socialist politics really at all. Yeah. You know? But I, that, I'm just, you know, Austin. I don't think it would make sense that he was like a communist or a socialist, basically. But whatever. It's a funny joke. That's all that matters. And uh, yeah, we got on to uh, Dr. Evil next, Michael. So uh, Mike Myers, of course, is playing two characters. Uh, do you know who Myers sought to play Dr. Evil initially? Uh, Chris Farley. No. Um, Surely that would be like Fat Bastard. Well, I see what I was thinking. The reason why I said Chris Farley is just because of the fact that Chris Farley was originally going to play Shrek and then he got replaced by Michael Myers. <laughs> I say replaced, I mean he died, you know. Yeah, he died. But, um, yeah. yeah, replaced. Um, uh, Christopher Walken? Or like a John Malkovich or something? Like, uh, no, they seem... he, okay. he was the funny man of the 1990s. Oh, okay. Uh, like Jim Carrey? Jim Carrey, yes. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I was just thinking of like Dana Carvey, because I know they like collaborated, so that would have also been... If I hadn't already got the answer right, I would have gone for Dana Carvey. Do, do you mean Dana? Oh, I'm sorry that I say it. Yeah, Dana Carvey. That does sound right. I feel like, yeah, okay. I think it's because, like, his name's Dan. Like, it, it's Dan, so I think Dan, but yeah, sorry. It is, you're yeah. technically right. It is pronounced Dana Carvey. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's really that, like, complicated. I think that's pretty... I mean, Dana, what kind of fucking Dana. name is that? You know, well, the thing <laughs> is, I'm not going to lie, I always used to kind of think in my head, I don't know why, but, like, in my head, I always imagined him, actually, like, that his surname was Akavi. So okay. I think I just don't really know much about his name. I don't really know much about anything, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, well, it's interesting you say that. We'll get on to Dana Carvey. Yeah, I think it's interesting because if they would have hired um, uh, Jim Carrey, then the movie probably would have cost $45 million. <laughs> well, he would have commanded a, a salary, which would, yeah, have got closer to that amount for sure. Uh, but yeah, again, you get to play two characters, save a lot of money on, on the costs. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, so his initial plan was not to play multiple characters in the series, but I guess he was like, ah, might as well. Oh, also, and... didn't you say that his inspiration was Peter Sellers? Yes. Who plays two characters in Doctor Strangelove. He does, doesn't he? Even though I haven't seen that movie. Yeah, and he kind of plays two characters in Lolita, except he didn't really play two <laughs> characters, but you know, he plays different roles in Lolita. Yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. so uh, Carrie was interested in the part, but he had to turn down the role due to scheduling conflicts with Liar Liar. Uh, ah. I think he made the wrong choice there. But Yes, anyway. I've never seen Liar Liar. Sounds like yeah. a funny premise. I think it is funny, a funny premise. I think it is kind of funny, but it's the same yeah. thing in the nineties with like, oh, he needs to connect with his kid more, and he needs to get back with his wife. Yeah. And I feel like that's a very nineties kind of movie. Uh, but however, Mike, here's the thing: Dana Carvey. Oh, really? I told you. It's funny that you said that. Dana Carvey, Maya's longtime collaborator on Saturday Night Live and the Wayne's World movies, felt the character of Dr. Evil was copied from Carvey's impression of SNL executive producer L- Lorne Michaels. I thought you'd... No. Oh, sorry. You know, for a minute I was like, is he waiting for me to say... I do know the name Lorne Michaels, but I couldn't... Um, I wouldn't have... Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't have actually guessed it. Yeah, and uh, and was unhappy about it. So Dana Carvey didn't like that. Didn't, oh, wow. Didn't, didn't, didn't like it. Yeah, because it's like, oh, this is my fucking, you know, Lorne Michaels impression. What are you doing? But... Yeah, he he stole it, and look at you know you, you gotta you gotta stab your friends in the back at some point. At some point, you've got to if you want to make it in Hollywood. I was actually thinking about mentioning the fact that um that Dana Carvey, of course, made the film Master of Disguise, where he uh where he does play a co- comedic uh, master spy. So clearly, he got his revenge on Austin Powers eventually, or on Mike Myers eventually. Because yeah. I'm pretty sure that film came out after. I'm going to look it up when it came out. Okay. Anyway, so uh, with Dr. Evil, we have, I think, a more deliberate parody of a James Bond villain. Like, Austin Powers, obviously, is kind of a parody of James Bond, but not really, because, of course, his character is nothing like James Bond. But Dr. Evil is very much a parody of um, mm. of uh, James Bond villains. Oh, who was that guy in Spectre? And Diamonds Are Forever. That villain. Bloom- Bloomfeld? Yeah, Blo- 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 Blofeld. Blofeld. Blofeld, that's it. Yeah, that, that, that's what it is, kind of. Also, no, no nuance with the name either. Dr. Evil. 
did uh, did George Lucas write this character, Michael? Yeah. Actually, speaking of which, how did you feel about the guy being called Basil Exposition? I thought that was a little bit on the nose, just well, while we're insulting things. The thing is, they don't really. I I think it's I think it's just kind of there. I'm fine with it. I don't think it's yeah. Really, they don't make a big deal out of it. Yeah, that's fine. They don't make a big deal out of it. They say his name like twice, his full name. So yeah, I think it's fine, really. Uh, I I think it's weird when they like have Austin like hit his mother. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, that was weird. Like it yeah. was kind of like there wasn't really any. Yeah, it was I weird. Know. That's that's what what I said about with some stuff not really being necessary. But yeah, I I love the character design of Doctor Evil. Of course, he's an iconic villain, you know. And uh, you know the scar is great, as is the suit and the bald head. You know, just another another great creation from Myers. And of course, the thing he does with his little finger. And, you know, the hand, that's fun to yes. do, isn't it? One billion dollars. One billion dollars. Again, it's just a really fun thing to try and imitate. And, uh, yeah, of course, Mr. Bigglesworth. Why I make thought... trillions when you could make billions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, um, the Mr. Bigglesworth being a Siamese cat, I think that's good as well. I like that bit. Uh, yeah, and I think his lair, again, is a great parody of a Bond villain's lair. You know, the chairs that tip into the fire pit. Did you enjoy the death of Will Ferrell? Was that a funny moment? Um, uh, yeah, well, what's interesting is I'm pretty sure that's actually a running joke because I'm pretty sure in the second film, there's another yes. Hitman shows up played by Will Ferrell. So yeah, um, so I guess, you know, the fact it's a, a, a running joke, I think retroactively makes it even better. Um, but yeah, I mean, as it was, it was kind of, it was kind of funny. It kind of gets to the um, like interesting, like they do play a bit of the whole, funny gory thing like the other examples where the guy gets his head eaten by um by sea bass <laughs> mutant sea bass but yeah like that kind of idea of like stuff that is actually quite i guess disturbing it, it, in like an actual context like almost more violent than anything you'd expect to see in an actual james bond film but like yeah. played for comedy and yeah i kind of liked that although it was a bit weird that it was like this isn't like hot fuzz you know where it's like lots of really intense like gory violence yeah. all the time it's just like randomly appears every now and then you well, get like something the- horrible you don't really see Will Ferrell though. That's the thing. I don't remember yeah, it even counts. It's just as... implied. Yeah, and I am very badly burned. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, it could have gone on for I think a bit longer because you know, obviously they shoot him in the arm. Yeah, and, and then they the... shoot him in the head. Yeah, but surely he could. Have, ah, you shot me in my other arm. I now uh, don't have any arms. Why would you do this to me? See, I was thinking like he'd be like, "You shot me in my head," like, and just like he doesn't die from that. He's like, "Oh, you shot me in my head. I can feel my brain matter." <laughs> Leak yeah. it out. What are you doing? Maybe. That's the thing. I think they could have gone one more with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but of course they, they didn't, you know, uh, and yeah. Was it was Will Will was Will Ferrell wearing like dark makeup playing was he called? Oh uh, yeah, no, yeah, I think he I think he was. I, I feel like, yeah, 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 yeah. I think so yeah, I guess it was like a, a mild case of the old uh, of the old black face. But mm. it's kind of I mean obviously it's technically brown face, but yeah. I feel like um Yeah, you're technically right, but I feel like it's one of those things where um I mean, I didn't care, but yeah, I suppose actually. Oh, wow. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I hate to be. I hate to be so alpha, but like, <laughs> up yours, woke. Wait, <laughs> up yours, woke, Marlis. We'll see who cancels who. <laughs> well, Farrell should be allowed to be brown. I yeah, but, I mean, the thing is, like, obviously, um, yeah, like, I would say, in a way, like, I feel like blackface should be the exception rather than the rule. In other words, like, of what's with- allowed. Uh, yeah, so it's like, or like, no, no, no the opposite. So like, because basically, obviously, like, generally speaking, if you've got somebody who like does impressions, and obviously, will you know, like, all of the SNL people, like, impressions is a big part of it. I feel like it has to be kind of acceptable to just be like, which I know it's not nowadays, but like to okay. have. Well, if someone's well, an impressionist, Michael they should be able to play. For... They should be able to play an Arab guy and just have it be kind of funny. Um, and, you wow. know, all the PC woke mob shouldn't get so upset about it. But I will say, again, just because I don't want to go too extreme, that I do think full-on uh, black minstrel show uh, <laughs> is not acceptable. So just let that be okay. out there for the record. Yeah, I think... But, uh, um, Rick Mickey is fine. Yeah, I get it. It's, 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 a very, it's a very dangerous line you're treading, really. Uh, but yeah, as we uh, we can all agree that Mickey Rooney is fine. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, the other villains... I think are quite funny too. Uh, they are parodies of things in culture. You know, the Irish guy. You know, the Irish. The Irish were, were big in the nineties, weren't they, with all the bombings? You know. Yes. They, uh, that's why he's in that movie. And obviously, the German um, woman in leather. Fra- Fraulein something. Fraulein something. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think all of that is. Um, I, I get again kind of funny, but I think the 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 Korean guy is the only guy which is like a direct James Bond parody. Yes, because he's yeah. uh, oddball. That's the name of the. Uh, that's the name of the James Bond character. I remember because he like and he like throws his hat. Not odd job. Oh yeah, sorry. It's, yeah. Oh, oh, what an idiot I am. Yeah, you're right. Odd <laughs> job. Um, 
And yeah, obviously, I like how at the end I noticed like jumping right to the end, but when he like wow. uh, you finally see him throw his shoe, and it's just like he just gets his. I was actually thinking, sorry, I know I'm jumping to the end, but we're talking about the villain, so it's fine. Yes, it's um, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, um, when he throws you, I was kind of thinking it would be even funnier if like because obviously he then does like successfully wrestle with Austin Powers. I was thinking it would be yeah. funnier if like he threw his shoe, and then after he did that, he was literally completely incompetent. Like there was nothing else he could do apart from just throw his shoe. And then uh, he yeah. died. It was a one trick pony thing, yeah. Uh yeah. Who throws a shoe? Honestly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's that was said a lot after George Bush had the shoes thrown at him. Oh, yes. Uh but yeah. Uh I, I think now we should move on to I guess the one theme in this movie, Michael, if there is a theme, that time has passed these characters by. You know? Mm. It's Powell's, a lot like No Country for Old Men. A lot like that. Austin Powers and Doctor Evil, time has passed them by. Now they're in the nineties. And of course they're, you know, stereotypes of characters that existed in the sixties, so time has passed them by. You can't really do those characters um anymore. They don't work for, for movies, even though James Bond kept trying up until two thousand and six. But yeah, uh, obviously Doctor Evil, you know, they they joke about, you know, his idea to destroy the ozone layer. Um, mm-hmm. and obviously, you know, Prince Charles getting a divorce, which, you know, they could have made a Princess Diana joke in there somehow. Very yeah. lucky. She died like months later. That could have aged really badly. Um, yeah, that's actually really impressive. They managed to avoid it. <laughs> yeah, they managed to avoid it. But yeah, you got this fish out of water comedy uh, for, you know, Dr. Evil being in, you know, the, the modern day, uh, which is kind of funny. I think the million dollars bit is a, is the best. It's like, yeah, yeah, where it's like one million. Yeah. Because like, um, that is a large amount, but you're like, actually, no, that's not really, that's nothing really, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I think also his line, three, three me a freaking boon over here. <laughs> yeah because he has no idea what's going on yeah I, I think that is yeah that is funny oh that reminds me of something else actually in the out time thing i was thinking like it would have been funny if when austin powers got the uh, cool on his laptop if he would have picked the laptop up like it was a, a telephone like and like held it to his ear i i thought to myself when i was watching i was like oh that would have been just a little bit of like an extra a little subtle joke about how obviously he would have no idea what a laptop is or how to use it yeah uh but well let's get on to that now because um you know, oh, the fact that, well, Dr. Evil, of course, he gets portrayed by his henchman in the end is is good. I think, you know, it's not really set up, but it works with the theme of time passing him by. Uh, and I think that the theme of time passing him by is, is better than the, uh, or that theme, how it how that's deployed in relation to Dr. Evil's storyline is better than how it's deployed to Austin Powers' storyline. Because, you know, they didn't really do a lot of the fish out of water stuff for Austin Powers. You know, again, you, you use the example of the laptop, you know, picking it up like a phone would have been better. Um, yeah, and then there's some Americans that laugh at him in Las Vegas. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. When he's like, does the peace sign, and they they laugh at him. Yes, like, that's that's really that's really it. Yeah, it's very of, isolated. Yeah, I mean, there's there's jokes about you know the 90s not being as sexually liberating, and you know the drugs not being as accessible. You know, like oh yeah, protection free sex, but of course you can't do that now because of AIDS. Um, I feel like that was a big thing in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. because of fuck AIDS. I, what did AIDS peak? It was like 93, I think. But yeah, I mean, that... when did we hit peak AIDS? I th- is are you searching that? Yeah, I just don't know what to bring up with. Um, oh, this is interesting. See, the thing is, this is probably including Africa. This is why, because it says oh. it reached a peak in two thousand and five. No, that's obviously not. Yeah, actually. and I think I think that's got to be to do with Africa. We, yeah, we mean America. When did? It... Yeah. Okay. Wait. Oh, uh, nineteen ninety five. Oh, so uh, okay, that's yeah, interesting. So, uh... so I said ninety three. So. That's interesting because you really think of it as an eighties disease, you know, with Reagan. But uh, yeah, peaks all the way in the mid nineties. Wow. Uh, anyway, so enough about AIDS. Um, but th- that's the thing that that's really it. You know, I think it on <clears throat> the theme would have been better. The theme would have been enhanced. You know, time passing, Austin Powers by, if uh, Austin had to try and prove himself because everybody, you know, in British intelligence in the Ministry of Defense thinks he's like this washed up like idiot from the from the sixties and he can't make it in the nineties. And I think that would work for the theme and it would work for the plot as well. Because, you know, the plot is pretty damn thin. You know, it's yeah. like they go to Las Vegas, they find Doctor Evil and they foil his plans. If you worked in some stuff about, oh, Austin Powers messing up and not being good enough for the modern era. Um, yeah, and, like, if, yeah, because, yeah, he couldn't deal with yeah. all of the new stuff. Yeah, Basil Exposition is still in his corner because he worked with him. Uh, but, like, other people at the Ministry of Defense are like, nah, this Austin Powers, he's, he's not worth it anymore. You know, we should have, we shouldn't have him on this mission. He's not good enough. We need someone else. Uh, and you know he is kind of he saves the day, overcoming those odds that have been placed on him, uh, and that I think that would have been better. And it also kind of would have tied in with the theme from remember Goldeneye when mm. fucking M calls James Bond a Cold War relic. Yes. Um, yeah, and that kind of would if they added that more into this movie, and then him proving himself, kind of like Bond does in Goldeneye. It's like no, yeah, being a being a sexist predator is still the way to go if you're a yes, exactly. Agent. 
Yeah, and that I think that would have been, been good. Could have been the same for Austin Powers. You know? uh, yeah, like he. <sighs> I mean, maybe this is adding too much of a bigger element to the plot, because it, he could have been paired with like a more modern 90s agent who like doesn't like the fact that, for instance, Austin Powers uh, had sex with uh, a lot of vagina to get yes. the information. He's like, why didn't you just steal it? You know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. No, I had to do it, baby. That's how I get the information, baby. Got a shag, baby. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Uh, yes, they could yeah. have had a uh, they could have had a frank discussion about the ethics of um, people with government authority uh, <laughs> having sex while working undercover. Yeah, and again, Austin Powers could have just been like, "Nah, baby, I like shagging, baby." <laughs> I can I can think of what Austin Powers would say in that situation. He's a very, uh, I think, easy character to write lines for. Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, but anyway, so let's get on to um, uh, well, 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 we'll talk about Austin Powers being, you know, a bit of a, a predator. Yes. Um, Do you think I, that's controversial in this um? In this day and age of uh, of me too, do you think it, it ages poorly? Because I was kind well, of. I was what kind do you of, think no. it does? Um, I would say that I think they do a good job. I think they kind of save themselves with the comment about him not banging her because she's drunk. Like I think that basically kind of s- fixes it because, like, as it is, she is very much like, "I'm not interested in you," and he's like, "Come on, baby, you know you want it." Um, which is obviously like not okay because you know Harvey Weinstein, the only sexual predator yeah, they, to have they, ever they, existed. They they could go further with it, but the, the, that's the thing. I don't think it ages badly at all. Him being a bit of a sex pest because that's the whole point. Because it's because it's like it's 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 bad. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was thought you were going to say because it's like a kind of critical thing, but what? you were going to say like because it's like a thing from the six. So I I thought you were going to say like it's not bad because it's like a flaw of his character. Well, obviously it's a flaw with his yeah. character. Obviously, but the point is that. The, the movie is basically James Bond versus, I mean, this obviously this foppish versus version, reality, a foppish version of James Bond versus the political correctness of the 1990s. So, yeah, it's which, basic Nessa. Yeah, which I think makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, oh, he thinks he can shag everyone. And Vanessa's just like, no, that that's not happening. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but again, there is an issue. I think with Vanessa, she falls for him r- rather easily. Yeah. After being, they don't really develop that. Yeah. After being put off by him and all of a sudden, you know. He's like, oh, let me take your picture, baby. You're really sexy, baby. Let me take you over a night on the town, baby. You know, and all of a sudden, then she likes him. Um, I, I, there should he should I don't know save her life or something. Yeah, I don't know. There should be something more than just oh, she now likes him. That's poorly done. But yeah, overall, I'm fine with him being a sex pest because yeah, James Bond. You know, obviously that's a criticism of Bond back in the day, and this is kind of James Bond brought into the modern era or the '90s, and he's you, he can't really jive in the a politically correct world. Which, again, was one of the themes of uh, Goldeneye yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Do you think I should have had a scene where um, Austin Powers talked about how he believes that a woman needs a good slap every now and then? <laughs> yeah, you know what? That would have been a bit meta, because, of course, it's Connery who said that, not Bond. I know, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that, <laughs> that would have been fun. Uh, and yeah, obviously, he says the classic line, do I make you horny, baby? Um, I think, yeah, that is probably the most classic quote from the movie. If you had yes. to rank, If you had to rank it, that would be number one, right? No, yeah, I, I definitely agree, and yeah, it was that's why it was the one that I gave a shout out to. Yes, because well I done. thought yes, yes definitely. But, yeah, uh, I think you're right in saying yeah, Vanessa does fall for him quite easily, you know. Um, but obviously, you know, I guess maybe it's a joke on the role of the Bond girl, like oh, she just falls for James Bond for no reason. Maybe it's a joke, you know, on that. I'm I'm not sure, but yeah, um, she doesn't. <laughs> I I don't think Elizabeth Hurley is that good an actor either. Mm. But again, maybe that's the point as well. Like when she just her line deliveries are just like really, just I don't know. She, she she her line deliveries are like she's talking to Austin like he's a kid. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so anyway, posing as a married couple, Austin and Vanessa track number two to Las Vegas. Uh, again, I love the fact that he plays blackjack. <laughs> again, just a very simple game. Mm. Uh, you know, the most simple card game you could find, and he plays it wrong. Like, <laughs> I know. I just, that's very funny. I think that's probably the most famous yeah. Bond, Bond thing, right? Yeah. Um, gambling in a casino. Yeah, so it is fun that he introduced that. Isn't that like, yeah. I feel like I might be wrong, but I feel like that's the thing he's doing in the first ever Bond film. Um, casino Royale? Is that? Oh, Doctor No? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can't think, yeah, I'm not sure. Because I know there's definitely is a thing where he's like playing poker or something and he gives a bet and the person's like, oh, that's a bet from, who is it? And the guy says, Bond. 
and it's definitely sean connery james oh, Bond, anyway yeah. Um, yeah, yeah but yeah basically um yeah I, I agree it's funny like it's kind of funny how he does it because yeah obviously he's like he's like he, he wants to live dangerously but like usually it'll be like you live dangerously by you know like risking the thing yeah. it's like he lives dangerously by not going high at all he just doesn't understand the game like the yeah. most simple game uh yeah, yeah that's great uh but yeah uh again that's that's really good satire uh, of uh of james bond's stuff uh but yeah obviously he meets his italian secretary uh number two's uh lots of vagina which is again a parody of a bond girl's names being double entendres of course i think it's specifically a parody of uh, pussy galore where was pussy galore from um I- i'm not sure wait i'm gonna find out pussy galore i think she's from a uh, uh, what's it called oh god i'm gonna remember this is one. it octopussy no, I think gold. It is from Goldfinger. I thought Gold it was. Yeah, sorry. Finger. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. From Goldfinger. I just thought Octopussy because it's pussy galore. But yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, uh, I think it's kind of low hanging fruit on that one. You know, a lot of vagina, uh, but you know, it's a classic, and you know, it has to be in there. I guess. Uh, what what is the most? What is the more ridiculous name actually? Pussy galore or a lot of vagina? <laughs> well, I feel like vagina is 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 a weird name that I've never really heard of. It's Italian, um, Michael. Yeah, um, I think that. I mean, the funny thing is, Pussy Galore really is like it's it's very close, which means it almost doesn't. I also like. I think in a in the second one, there's Ivana Hump a lot. That's great. That's 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 probably actually the worst. Yeah, yeah Ivana Hump a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, we get some nice comedy then again with the strate- uh, strategically placed objects that stop the audience from seeing Mike Myers' dick. Yes, they like that joke. I think they do it in, like... I mean, they do it twice in this film. Yeah. And I think they do it several times in, like, some of the other films, too. Yeah, yeah. Again, I, I think it's something that he probably... Mike Myers got from, like, old-school British comedy back in the day. That yeah. feels like very old-school British comedy. Like, oh, you know, oh, you can't actually see this guy's penis because he, it's been blocked by uh, a jar. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that, that that seems like yeah. And obviously they do it at the end as well. But speaking of, they do um that that must have been frustrating though, the takes. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, actually yeah, because they'd have to like yeah. really kind of Yeah, actually I didn't really think about how like the visual comedy there would have required quite a bit of uh coordination. Um yeah. I think I don't think the one at the end with uh Vanessa is that complicated. No but yeah. The one with Mike Myers and like her hand is just covering him. That's yeah, must have been a bit a bit of a challenge. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, uh, Dr. Evil learns that during his absence, his associates have artificially created his son, Scott Evil, using his frozen semen. Uh, now a Generation X teenager, or, the, you know, the Beamers, they hate the Gen Xs, mm. and then they hate the Millennials more. It's it's still to be determined whether they'll hate the Zoomers more than the Millennials, but yeah. It's just funny to see <laughs> them mock, like, Generation X. Uh, but anyway, Scott is resentful of his father's absence and resists his attempts to get closer to him. And yeah, um, again... Time has passed Dr. Evil by that kind of theme with with his son. Yes. He clearly just lives in a different world to him. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a nice idea for Dr. Evil to have a son who's an estranged son. I think that's a fun concept again. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I liked it. Um, and yeah, they did have the whole, um, yeah, like kind of, I guess, giving the villain kind of relatable personal drama works. Uh, I will say that I thought the um, bit where he like kind of tells his family history, the only thing I didn't like about that is I thought it like needed to build up to something because it kind of felt like it just ended like kind of arbitrarily. Like it just like says a whole bunch of things, like random things, and then just like, okay, that's, that's enough. True. Yeah, that's and I, was true. Like, I was like thinking like when I was like, oh, I should have like built up to something like like a little bit of a punch at the end. But it is it is great when he says, my father had a penchant for buggery. Yes. I just think that's a great line. So it's worth it for that. Uh, but yeah, so obviously when he takes Scott to the father son bonding therapy group session, yeah, a great idea, just a lot of potential, you know, and yeah, relatable family drama with this evil supervillain, you know, it's that's it's it's in, inherently funny, and what well, <laughs> I want to start a petting zoo, <laughs> how about an evil petting zoo? Yeah. I again just uh, kind of writes itself, and yeah, I I love the, the <laughs> oh, oh, what what does Scott say? I think he's trying to kill me, and then the therapy leader goes like oh he's not actually trying to kill you and he's like no the warrior is actually quite perceptive i am actually trying to kill him <laughs> but yes yeah i again just i i really like that scene so many great moments uh just absurd but yeah it, it works because of that uh and yeah scott again later on in the movie kind of acts like an audience surrogate um you know when he's saying hey why don't you just kill austin powers by shooting him and, and there was an snl joke about that an snl sketch before this movie came out about how mm. all these super villains who you know, they, they wrote a book about how uh, to deal with James Bond. And they the, the number one advice was kill him immediately. Don't tell him your plans. Just kill him right away. 
because uh, of course that's you know it's a, it's a well-known trope in James Bond movies that the villain just doesn't kill him um, which is funny because one of the most famous lines from Bond is do you expect me to talk no I expect you to die yeah there's um, the expectation yeah. but not uh, acted out with um, you know yeah. sin- sincere intent yeah um, yeah, so, I mean, it's quite a classic joke, yeah, like the whole setting up in it. Yeah. But I'm not sure whether or not, because, I mean, obviously the other example I'm thinking of is that um, I think the uh, Incredibles make a joke about the whole monologuing thing, like, oh, he yes. starts monologuing. Uh, yes. So, yeah, they weren't the first people to come up with the joke, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it is a well-known joke, but yeah, the monologuing is a specific, like, term, which I think captures it really well. Uh, but yeah, um, why don't you just shoot him now? I'll, you know, I'll get my gun and we'll shoot him together. You know, I like that, because oh, it could be a fathersome activity, and Dr. Evil's just like... No, I want to... Oh, yeah. Of course, we get the classic line, Michael. Uh, I want sharks with freaking laser beams attached yes. to their heads. Yeah, and uh, I think that that does, again, sat- uh, satirize yes. well. These these Bond villains, just insane, just plans. Instead of just kill, just get a gun, shoot him in the head. But no. Uh, yeah. And, he is, yeah. yeah, he is good at, like, cooling it out. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Austin and Vanessa infiltrate Virtuacon headquarters, but are apprehended by Dr. Evil's henchmen uh, and random task which is his name, by the way, not because, you know, our job, random task. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but here's the thing, they change clothes, don't they? Vanessa and Austin. And yes. And I suspect a scene got cut out of them, you know, disguising themselves as Vanessa as like a fembot and um, Austin as some random, you know, silver suit. Uh, they just decided to skip that. I, there's this random line about, um, oh, do you like your quasi-futuristic clothes? I designed them myself. That's what... yeah. Dr. Evil says. And I don't think he says it when he's on the camera. It might be added in post-production. So yeah, I think that that's definitely a scene that got cut out somewhere of them having to change clothes and uh, that didn't make it in the final cut for some reason. That's what I suspect, Michael. You know, that's a I think that's a good suspicion. Indeed. So anyway, uh, Powers, Austin Powers and Vanessa escape Dr. Evil's death trap and Kensington is sent to help. While searching for Dr. Evil, Austin is confronted by the fembots, and of course, another Bond reference. I think this one is clever because it's just like in this in the James Bond movies, like the hot women are basically like sex robots, basically. Like that is their mm. function: to have sex with James Bond or kill him. That's the only thing they they're useful for, right? Yeah, which is really misogynistic against robots. <laughs> yeah, and again, just a, an absurd way to defeat them. No, as well. no, yeah, I mean, yeah, because it kind of works with the fact, that obviously, like, yeah, the. Yeah, that's it. Like, basically, uh, the James Bond women often use, I guess, like, seduction as a kind of, uh, you know, thing in their arsenal to yes. uh, help them win. So, yeah, yeah it makes sense. They, they seduce James Bond and they kill him. That's the two things that they're useful for in James Bond movies. So, yeah, this is just that, you know, um, distilled, basically, without any of the excess baggage, I guess. Uh, and, yeah, um, at this point, do you think the music sounds like the Incredibles music? Do you, do, do you recall I that didn't. Moment? I didn't really notice that. I can't really think uh, how the music goes. Could you hum the melody? Du, du, du. Uh, it's it's hard to do. Yeah, I also don't really know. I can't really remember how the Incredibles music goes. Yeah, I, I remember it sounds r- literally exactly like the Incredibles music. It's it's crazy. Uh, you should look it up. Uh, but anyway, yeah. um, Austin confronts Doctor Evil. Then they are then interrupted by Number Two, who attempts to portray Doctor Evil, making a deal with Austin. And yeah, I think what I thought interesting at the end with you know. <laughs> Fucking number two, like saying, "Hey, I, I, I like this. Like, hey, corporations run the world now. You don't need to yeah. be super, super evil to get a lot of money. You know, like just be a corporation. You can get all the money you like. That's how it is nowadays. It's just yeah. like, yeah, if, if you want to be evil, you don't need to take over the world. You just need to be like, you know, a fucking guy who's a CEO of a major corporation. Uh, and I think yeah, that's which I think, yeah, that is like a good thing to make fun of. The fact that a lot of the time these villains have like ridiculously elaborate <laughs> plans that yeah. aren't necessarily even the best way to achieve their goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think if you see modern Bond movies, you know, this, it's always like a, a CEO who's the villain, you know, and they're not trying to take over the world. They're trying to use, they're, they're trying to get money, basically. That's how. Like, yeah. They're, yeah, they're trying to, you know, engineer a situation where they get more money, not necessarily like take over the world. Uh, I think of like Quantum of Solace, remember? That guy mm. who wanted to take the wars from Bolivia or something? I can't remember something like that. Imagine uh, an yeah. evil businessman trying to exploit Bolivia. I know, right? Crazy. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Oh, Elon Musk, he should be the next villain in the next James Bond movies. Damn. We, I mean, Elon Musk should just be the villain in every movie. That's that's my opinion of it. Uh, but yeah, uh, obviously we get the... Who who throws a shoe, honestly? Yeah, they, they, they marry on their honeymoon. Do... Uh, to Vanessa and Austin. And Austin proves, you know, he's just a one-girl one, one girl guy, baby. That's groovy for me, you know. That's his character arc. He, he adapts to the 90s, Michael. 
So mm. yeah, he, he he adapts to the modern day. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's the end of the movie. So yes. let's conclude. You oh, first. you know, I never actually mentioned my uh, my favorite uh, comedic bit. I think it was uh, my favorite comedic bit because I was pleasantly surprised by it. And I think it's appropriate for me to include this in the conclusion because obviously, uh, I think uh, some level we have to say, it in the review. I could have included it in the review, but I kind of just forgot to mention it. Of course you did. Um, you know, like a hero. But like I say, the reason why I can include it in the conclusion is because, you know, comedy is a big part. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised by it because it was the bit where, um, so basically he goes to the toilet and I was thinking, oh, is it just going to be like a joke where like he, he, you know, like goes for a really stinky poo or like there's like some really loud noises and it's going to be like farting and it's not really going to be a joke about him just, oh, it's farting. And, and then they had the whole thing. Yeah, and he tries to get assassinated and it's like the way like he's struggling to avoid the assassination and the guy thinks he's like trying to take shit and then like they just take it to another level with the whole, who does number two work for? <laughs> it's just like, I just found that really funny. The idea of like somebody shouting that <laughs> their shit. Well, they're yeah. trying to like force it out. Um, I'm so glad I found you like that, that. Yeah, I did find that funny, and that's what I meant when I said like that's kind of you know you could say juvenile, but I think yeah, like that's the thing. Um, the comedy I do think is probably on balance a little bit hit hit and miss, and I think like when I think there's more hits than misses. Yeah, I, but I think like if you're watching this with somebody, you would probably like be a, like you'd notice the misses a little bit. Like obviously the the I think the worst thing is just like the things that go on a bit too long. Um, yes. I think that's the only issue. Uh, but yeah, like when the comedy works, it, it is good um you know is it i I feel like i actually from my memory prefer the uh the sequels maybe a bit more in terms of comedy uh yeah in terms of like the plot it's you know quite thin there's nothing really to get that invested in um and in terms of like as a parody of james bond yeah it, it works well i mean i guess the only kind of issue is like nowadays you'd be like well these things are kind of obvious but you know i think it's fine uh it was obvious because of this movie yeah yeah i think that's it yeah it's one of those things where like you know the film kind of because now everyone wants to point all this stuff out it's like yeah uh but yeah overall it is good um i don't know if i can say it's like a masterpiece or anything like that Uh, i suppose it does get points for like the whole one it doesn't get points it gets kudos for classic like the fact it's like a classic film like anyone who hasn't seen it should see it uh especially if they've seen the other two films and have kept putting off watching the first film for some stupid reason um so so, what are you gonna give it but I'm uh, I'm only gonna give it uh, maybe it sounds low I'm gonna give it a low seven. Okay, no, no, no. I'm I'm also gonna give it seven. Okay. So yeah, I don't think that's, that's low. Yeah, no. But that's the thing. Like it's a the plot is a bit thin. Like it's yeah, a, it could use another. I think rewrite. You know, at, at some points. But yeah, no. The, the core of the movie, you know, is that it is funny. You know, that's the core of the movie. again a great satire of James Bond. That you know it, it really does work. The Austin Powers character is great. Again, I just in so many ways, you know. Again, we we went through them before. The Doctor Evil character is great as well, even if Mike Myers may have ripped off Dana Carvey. The the Scott character that's that's a great dynamic with with his dad. Yeah, it's just it's a lot of things. <coughs> sorry, are just inherently funny. I think, and yeah, it's a really it's a really funny movie, even though there are some misses, unfortunately. But you know, that's that's I think that's bound to happen, really. Uh, and yes, uh, of course, you know who, who? How can you not like a movie where the main character goes, "Oh, groovy baby." like that that's um it just works and uh yeah i think uh a seven out of ten is is fair um i think it, yeah the plot had been a bit better it could have been an eight out of ten you know again but uh it's you know, still still decent um but anyway michael uh, let's uh review oh we've got some receipts now for uh for nope remember that movie nope yes uh, which was released uh our rotten tomatoes guesses were as follows for nope uh, last week you guessed it would get 86 i guessed it would get 76 yeah. the, cor- the uh, correct answer was 82 uh, which means that you get a, a score of four, and I get a score of six because I was six away, you were four away. Uh, that means that our, our scores previously were 82 each. So you have a score of 86, and I have a score of 88, which means you are now leading by two because, of course, whoever has the lowest score is in the lead because they're the least further, the, well, the closest to the Rotten Tomatoes ratings. Uh, so, yeah, you, you've taken the lead, Michael. Well done. Yes. Good. I'm yeah. glad to hear it. I think it's going to be a while until we have a, have our next guest, but yeah, going yeah. into the, going into the summer break, you have a two point lead over me, uh, and yeah, uh, what are we uh, reviewing next week, Michael? Well, next week we're reviewing the film Bend It Like Beckham. Bend It Like Beckham. We are yes. starting. That's because of the Premier League. Yes, starts. Premier League. Yes. Yeah, but we are starting our two thousand and two extravaganza. Uh, t- so many movies that came out in two thousand and two in a row, and I can't wait, Michael. I can't wait. What a what a great year two thousand two was, right? Yeah. Oh wow. We've got yeah quite a few. I didn't realize that. In fact, all through August we're doing all through August. Yeah, we're doing films that came out in two thousand and two. Yeah, so I am excited for that. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, join us next week for Bended Leg Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, I see. But Will Ferrell can't wear <laughs> makeup. All right. Bye. Bye.